Joe presents Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby, together with Guinness. Hello, and you're very welcome to Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby, here on Joe, together with Guinness. Coming up on today's show, Monsters Hopes of European glory have been blown to schmitterines by Garces and Saracens, I must say. Um, a man wearing a retro monster jersey confronts and scares the shit out of Billy Von Apollo, the poor fella. Uh, Leinster SWAT to lose aside, and Warren Gatlin has been set for the Lions job. We've got your Maiden Moore Player of the Weekend results, a nice interview with Monster and Ireland legend John the Bull Hayes. Uh, we answer all your Twitter questions, including a cracker on Game of Thrones, and we also have a special guest to come on and talk about Game of Thrones, which I want to start by talking about. You have seen episode two. Yeah. You f didn't give me the memo that you were going to watch crap. it. You wouldn't like it. Don't bother. Everyone else has probably seen it at this point now as well. Yeah. So like, I'm, I've only seen episode one and I'm like yeah. talking from the past. Yes, you were like Pat last week talking about the Masters before Tiger. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah so. what about that? I remember, and I listened to it there. Well. Yeah, you thought about that one. I got to fail. We were, we were right. We both back Tiger. Jeez, we've moved on along. The world has moved on mm. so quickly, hasn't it? So <laughs> That's only a week ago. Do you remember Tiger won the Masters <laughs> years ago? <laughs> um, but Game of Thrones, uh, I loved episode one. Like you told me last week to do a recap on YouTube. So mm -hmm. I watched a 30 minute long recap and night. then I watched the episode and you were not joking. So much was going down. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't, I didn't talk for 30 minutes. I was just like, whoa, uh, so much to take in. So many people, so many characters. Um, I thought it was like a night out around uh, the 23rd of December, yes. where you're yeah. at the local pub and loads of people from your past are there, your school or whatever, and you're like just trying to remember who the fuck everyone was <laughs> and whether you've you know shifted a few people and you can't remember <laughs> or what's going on, and then you get so bananas drunk, and then the next day you're kind of trying to piece together what happened, and you're like, was I on a dragon last night? And someone's <laughs> like, yeah, man, you were fucking flying around with that dragon, and you're like, jeez, then someone's like. Uh, do you remember shifting your your cousin? Your, your, your auntie? Like, my cousin, the blonde one, the hot one. Like, that's my aunt. It's like, yeah, it's <laughs> you're with your aunt. Man. And you're like, fuck, do people see that? And you're like, no, but I, I'd say everyone kind of knows, though. A lot of people are talking about it. Everybody like, fancies your aunt. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, <laughs> she's, she's gay me enough. Like, <laughs> so I'm just a little bit jealous. And uh, yeah, like you're, you're kind of just trying to piece it together. And then I was also thinking that Bran, isn't he very like Murray Kinsella? <laughs> He's like the head of Murray Kinsella. Can we get Pat? Can we get the two of them <laughs> on the screen side by side? And Murray, like I just picture Murray Kinsella just sitting there in his chair, just furiously <laughs> tweeting about rugby <laughs> and <laughs> making all these predictions. And like he's the guy that's sober and he's like telling you what he did the night before, like and he's just giving you all your stats because all the rest of us are just ranting randomly. <coughs> He knows everything. Like Murray Kinsella is so wise. He's just giving you all your stats. Like, man, you were you had fourteen points against last night and twelve Jaeger bombs and you puked twice and you only made like hundred and fifty yards over eighty minutes on not, your way not, home. Not only that though, he can tell you what you're gonna drink the following night because <laughs> yeah. he's seen it. Yeah. <laughs> and you're gonna piss in your wardrobe when you go home. <laughs> Yeah, so I was like, he slots in there perfectly um, for our little Game of Thrones cameo. I don't care whether he belongs to a family or not. It doesn't like, matter. It doesn't matter. You have no. to force him in there anyway. Yeah. Um, so. there's, a, there's a bit in the second episode where um, it's the night before a, a, a significant battle and they're all like standing around with candles and all. It's all atmospheric and they're drawn up like a battle plan or whatever. They're all chatting amongst themselves. <laughs> and then out of nowhere... <laughs> Uh, Brown is Brown pipes up, and they they all, none of them could be bothered listening to. Him, you know? <laughs> and I thought it was a little bit like um, before um, Six Nations. You know, you used to have a captain's meeting the night before. Yeah. And everybody was sitting around. Yeah. I just imagined that would be like like Drico or someone significant sitting in the back going, "Yeah, we're gonna play with a bit of width tomorrow." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everybody goes, "Why are you not in here in the huddle? Like, <laughs> don't be a weirdo. Come on." <laughs> Yeah, he is quite a weird character, but uh, look, 
He's, uh, he knows his stuff. He knows what's going down. He, he does. He's, he knows his stats. He's done he his does. homework. Yeah. With the rest of us. Um, but we will start with uh, Leinster or the Lannisters uh, of old, resurrected at the weekend against Toulouse. Uh, <coughs> Johnny Sexton run the show again. I mean, I, I talked to a lot of people before this game, and most people were suggesting that Toulouse were going to win, which. Uh, I suppose it was based on the fact that they did so well in the semi-final against 14 men. Leinster probably haven't played as well since the Six Nations finished. Johnny Sexton hasn't played for them since Christmas, so that maybe was just why people would have, have thought they were going to win. Yeah, but what, Jesus. What French teams do you know go away from home, uh, produce a big performance, big win, then go away from home again, back it up? Yeah. It's a one-off to have a big performance on the road. I thought Toulouse were handy enough. I thought they looked dangerous enough. Mm. Uh, and I thought... If maybe one or two little passes had a stuck, they could have threatened Leinster a lot more. They were very close to. I thought it was a lot closer than the scoreline. Yeah, Look, I think they they lacked like a ten and out half to control. They had no kicking game whatsoever. No way of exiting. No exit strategy. Jouer. Uh, Jouer, which I think, but just that's that allowed Leinster to just uh, take control. Yeah. So applying pressure when they needed to. Sexton's kicking from hand was brilliant. Kicking at goal was brilliant. McGrath's pace setting was class. I thought the James Lowe try from start to finish was just Leinster at their best, yeah. prime example. Scrum in the middle of the field on halfway and they have a little wraparound loop play on the right hand side. Yeah. Make Kearney makes a half break and then it's just pace and variety of play, loads of different angles. But like the, the mindset from the, the second the scrum was set was we're going to score here, mm. whether it be we force them into giving us a penalty or we score a try and it was like if you watch it back like Kona made a few carries like different players are going in playing scrum half if they beat McGrath to the ball just like that's the difference and then so someone will yeah. get there and just whip it Sean Kona made a little break and then James Lowe what a finish like yeah. just running over free kid yeah uh, Bezzy. was it Bezzy, Bezzy he ran over yeah, yeah. Um, he's so Kino good as well. he rode the tackle from Kaino as well yeah yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it just made me think, like, Scott Fardy and and James Lowe, like, two incredible signings. Fardy obviously scored again. Um, but, like, you know yourself, when you get, uh, f you know, foreign players or overseas players to come into the squad, it's it's so important, I think, that they are the kind of guys like Scott Fardy and James Lowe. Yeah. Because there is this contentious kind of uh, area where fans or even other players could be like, if they're not... Uh, if they're not better than other young local players, yeah. then why are you bringing them in? So they almost have to work harder to to win the love. Like they've got to be the best players. Some they of the best players buy, in the field. They have to be Pinars. Yeah, or exactly. Rocky Elson is another good example. Contepomi. Yeah, Monster. We had Dougie obviously, and and Rua Tapoki. Tapoki. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I think Scott Fardy in Leinster have Scott Fardy and James Lowe, two two of the best. Um, that you could ask for even watching James Lowe last year, like I watched the Saracens game they played last year in, in the quarter final, and he was unbelievable. And it's mad to think that they were potentially not going to start him if uh, I know if Gibson Park, which I understand as well, why, but, yeah. but they've got to start him from here on in, right? I think so. Mm. He is, he's ridiculous. Mm. If he gets a one on one at all, and he, he's got such a variety, he's got footwork, he's got leg drive. On that occasion with Bezzy, he just dipped unbelievably low Tiny. and just. Bounced in perfect timing. Then the next one, the try that was disallowed, just defend, just stayed up high. What do you call the wee South African fella, the winger? Colby, Colby, yeah. Colby just like just punched mm. Fan right in the chest. And, and he, he almost had one at the very end when he dropped it, going over the line, and that was a similar yeah. situation. Just bounced over the top of two. He players. finishes so well, doesn't he? Doesn't he? I mean, you can't just can't. Replace Never. He, that, there was a couple of times they kicked him and it looked like he was going to get isolated in the backfield as well. And he just mm. wriggles and fights and just hits and spins, and he's so powerful. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, look, to be honest, I, I, I agree with you on Toulouse. I think they're very dangerous, but not having a kicking game um, or not yeah. just playing field position, I think that you just can't beat Leinster like that. So they will come up against a different team in Saracens. Um, but I still would have, I would have Leinster as favourites, I'd say. Oh, in the final? Mm. No. No. Saracens are favourites for me. Yeah. I don't know. I think uh, Sexton seems to be back on form. Really... Um, Really control the game. Leinster were good. I think it. Leinster were, were a, a lot better than they were. Mm. I still don't think they were quite where they were a year ago. Yeah, I, th I thought that the timing, like not having 
picked a lot of these players in the last few weeks and uh, not having picked Sexton, that was a bit of a risk. I, but I thought decision making from the coaches were brilliant to do that. And they'll they could you know, hit a purple patch now, having rested those players. And you saw Sean O'Brien playing probably one of the best games he's played yeah, in he's years. Back. He's back and Conan was excellent. So it's mad the depth that they have, isn't it? Yeah. When they can still lose what, three or four back rowers and still have. Sickening, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it's sickening. Um, we actually have some audio from Johnny Sexton from the game, actually, that I'd like to play now just to show you how much good form he's in now <laughs> after the key win. I was confident with um, the reps that Reese had given me during the week that I had the ability to, to, to do the job today. Scott doesn't train anywhere during the week, so he's allowed to start a call on Saturday because he turns up on Saturdays. So. <laughs> you, know, you said that uh, Saracens would be your toughest team. Are they by far the best team you've played in that? Toughest is one thing, but are they the best? In the in ever. European Cup Finals. Yeah, in your European Cup Finals. Um, well, I think every final is tough. Um, they're always tough. Uh, you know, you don't get through European Cup final being a, an average team. I think, uh, but yeah, potentially, yeah. They've uh, they've had a lot of experience. They've had, they've lost finals. They've they've won finals. So they they've experienced both sides of the coin, and um, I'm sure that they're going to be relishing it. I think they, like I said, they prefer. I, I can't believe the amount of times they refer to our game. Or you, you hear the coaches all the time talking about it. So it's obviously a big regret for them and a big learning point for them and I'm sure they'll be relishing uh, getting the chance to, to put things right against us and um, you know the, the psychology of that I'll have to sort out and talk about it but uh, yeah they're, they're an exceptional team um, and we'll be uh, up against us but challenge that we were looking forward to. Okay that was Johnny Sexton there, um, interesting him saying that how much uh, emphasis Saris have put on the quarter final last year so obviously they're they're a little bit smarted over that one. Yeah, yeah. It seemed like um, Saracens seemed to learn a few lessons from that. They got beat and they got like, beat reasonably badly by, by an unbelievably good Leinster team at the, at the time. But I think Saracens learned a lot from that. They bounced back. They still won the Premiership. And then they've kind of continued that form now. I think Saracens look like a way better side than they were this time last year. Yeah, that, I suppose that brings us on to, to the Monster Saris game. Um I had a bit of a rant on Twitter last night. Numerous uh, rants. I did. I, went, I just went for it. I had a few pints, I'll be honest with you. You're just right. Uh, yeah. Uh, Gareth says, pissed me off majorly. I had, what did I have? I had three or four points. I think you, you probably read them anyway, but Penno against, ha or Penno against Haley for holding on the ball when he was clearly hit in the air by uh, Yeah. By Farrell. I agree with that one. That was shocking. Yeah. Like... Play it back and to not only not give the penalty to Munster but to give it to Saracens. Yeah. They, so the, the annoying thing about that is the the TMO or did they did they review that one? Or maybe I, just looked at it. I think the TMO may have while you know Gareth says was carrying on. Who's being whatever. proactive? Yeah, hopefully, <laughs> so, you'd hope. So um, the annoying thing about that is if 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 the law's there, you can't tackle them in the air. Mm. Then you don't just say, ah, but it's close to the ground because there has to be a line. It's yeah. either legal or illegal. So. You have to create a distinction at some stage, and that distinction's made when his foot hit the ground, and his foot didn't hit the ground. It was a, a good yard off the ground. Like. And that he, they might have thought, you know, in the video, it looks like his shoulder touches, mm. but the impact is then uh, like a second later, if you know what I mean, like the mm. once you slow frame it, like you did. Yeah. <laughs> Refer I mean, it, to, <laughs> to Barry's rant. Yeah, it took me <laughs> ten seconds to do that. Like, so yeah. why a TMO can't do it? And it's yeah, who's professionally trained? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's, uh, it, tw it changes the, the flow of a game. And then two minutes later... Uh, Car Car says, like, you know how to use the slow motion, okay, man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got, it's just tap, 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 <laughs> tap, tap. Um, and then Tyler Blendall gets, uh, gets penalised for going off his feet or a hole. I didn't even know what that one was for. That was just such a ridiculous uh, penalty. And there are two massive moments. Like, once they were in there, 22... Uh, trying to respond after conceding that one to go six three down, um, and then gave a, f a no forward pass for a, for a pass two minutes later from uh, from Saracens, which led to uh, another penalty. Um, then he gave another few penalties, and oh, look, I ranted a little bit more than I probably should have. But the, the um, someone someone in com uh, com uh, in comms made the point that Farrell knew that that for that pass was forward, so kicked it away yeah. on purpose. 
because he thought if we score here, it's going to get disallowed. Yeah. Give them the ball, they'll kick it out and we'll get a line out or whatever it was, the outcome. Yeah. It's going to be better than... Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, Murray kicked it out to touch and yeah. they, they, I think, uh, yeah, they got a penalty. I think it's probably a little bit too much credit to far off. Yeah. That. No. I think that was the tactic anyway, was once they were getting in yeah. into the close to Monster 22, was putting little dribbling balls in behind. Yeah. Because um, what happens then if you well. um, collects that, chip through... Mm. The stars and player, if it, who was it? Uh, it was Strattle. If yeah. he collects that, does he say, oh, I don't want to score? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> take it yeah, back, it'll be disallowed. Yeah. Um, look, I was gutted for Munster, to be honest with you. They, they worked incredibly hard. <coughs> they have worked very hard this season. They've gotten, you know, their defensive effort was absolutely phenomenal. They took a lot of pressure in that first half, but still managed to not only hold them out, but make massive dominant uh, tackles and make big reads, especially kind of out wide in those channels where Farrell and Conway and uh, uh, Haley were making big calls. That takes, takes its toll eventually, though. It does, it does. And I, I think did. when you're getting those decisions going against you as well, um, obviously it does. The other one was Tag Burns turned over. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. No, I mean, okay, you go, you, you're, you're, your hands are on the ball, you're trying to pull it free, the other player is holding on to it, so you, you don't control it when it comes free. So you're, you're trying to get it back, but that's... No. Is that different to like raking it back or Yeah. Having said that, I thought there was a lot of times Pete was being a little bit of a devil in there. Mm. A little bit off his feet and a little bit mm. like he would uh, quite this happens quite a bit. Lads choke and then there's a second goes by and then they go knee down and they go and they look at the ref and go and there's a moment and they've already done the damage. Mm. That's it's slowing you know. it down by a second though, as opposed to like Yeah, but I, Pete, Pete could have there could have been a couple of penalties one against Pete. And then there was one scrum. Listen, who are we to talk about scrums? But it looked like Saracens were dominant enough and yeah. went the other way. There was a couple of things that went the other way. All the ones you highlighted, agree with all of them. Yeah, then there were a few 50-50s that they can go their way. And Yeah, look, I mean, a, lot, a lot of people, I've, I, I think Saris were the better team. That's the bottom line here. And I don't think any of the Munster players or staff would, or fans would argue against that. Um, and I think a lot of players, people I've spoken to, I did a lot of... Uh, research in different pubs over the weekend, <laughs> just <laughs> drinking pints of Guinness, uh, getting the feedback. And a lot of people are obviously, you know, admire the effort, but still were questioning Munster's uh, attack tactics and whether they would have done enough um, to, you know, to bring that side of their game on to win these semifinals. What are your, what's your take on that? Uh, it's, it, they, they just didn't get anywhere near enough ball to kind of show that, really. Um, especially in the first half, they were just defending the whole time. That zaps their energy, so then whenever they do get the ball, then they haven't got any kind of buzz or any width or any kind of... They're just they're just knackered. Mm -hmm. they, can't, can't, they can't threaten or play with the sort of width or shape that they would do. Mm -hmm. uh, I just thought there was such an onslaught of, of Saracen's attack and width and um, lads coming onto the ball, serious pace, and they were getting lots of joy on those little... Um, we forward pods just coming straight off nine just straight in rather than playing with width to try and get round them mm. uh, and I thought that just took its toll and then as a result Munster were going right we haven't had the ball in ages or maybe they try and do something pull a rabbit out of a hat whenever they do get the ball to make mm. up for it but I, I think it's more more a case that Saracens were unbelievably impressive mm. I thought they were amazing at the weekend I think Munster's tactic all season is, but this is what I was trying to say to people is that they're they go 60 minutes and they hold, they keep it tight, as tight as possible. They play a lot of uh, positional, you know, kicking for either contestables or putting the ball long and just try and keep Saracens out of their half and just rely on their defence. And then after 60 minutes, then they'll try and um, create opportunities and try and score, which has worked for them against a lot of, I suppose, lesser teams. But when you come to the likes of Saracens or, or, Edinburgh, or Leinster, as you say, who can just keep providing that pressure and those clinical plays and I, I don't know they're 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 always going to come up short unless they can offer a little bit more and uh yeah I think like there was a pro they they did actually create quite a lot they you know that first uh first penalty they got they broke just broke Saracens a couple of times they showed that they can score with the ability to get the ball from from that scrum to the right wing when Sweetenham scored, like great skills from from Scannell and Farrell, but they maybe just need to create those those opportunities again, use those little backdoor passes a little bit more, and it's it is frustrating to watch when you're a fan when you when you know that these players are good enough to do it, 
and uh, that they don't potentially, you know, use the option to, to go out that back door or to play with a little bit more pace in the game. I feel like they try and slow down the game. There's, there's only about three or four occasions in the game where they could have had a go. Like I said about Leinster, when Leinster had that scrum, they were like, no, this is where we fucking kick in. We're Leinster yeah. now, we're going to score. Munster, I feel like if they were in that position, they'd play to the touchline, they'd play two phases, and then they'd slow it down, and they'd go, okay, now we'll need to keep this tight, put up a contestable, yeah. and uh, force them into an error. I don't think I don't think Munster, say, they, I don't think they decide that. I don't think they say, right, listen, it's, let, let's slow this down, then let's go to the air. I think they try and play with um, pace, and then whenever it does slow down, then they, it's, I think it's a sensible, sensible decision to put the ball in the air whenever you haven't got any, any structure, the pace of the ball isn't high enough. But I think it's probably because your breakdown isn't quick enough or you're not proactive enough. Leinster, keep it fast, keep it fast. But do you think, like, I th- like I've, I've heard them talk about, like, when, when, when options are exhausted after four or five phases, they'll, it's kick now, now we kick. Yeah. So if you think you've got that, mi- do you think if they've got that mindset that we're going to kick, that you're almost preparing yourselves to kick as opposed to, like, that doesn't come on your radar. It's like, and I think Ireland can fall into that trap as well a little bit. When it's like, if your if your whole goal is to just get quick ball, like Leinster, like I was saying, when they they anyone can pass the ball as a scrum half, it doesn't have to be your nine. It's like whoever's there first, just move the ball, shift. That's so hard to defend against. Yeah, but and like I think Ulster play with that game plan, Connor <coughs> play with that game plan. And a lot of the times against a team like Saracens, you put that game plan out against them, they'd struggle with that more than than the slow kind of trying to grind teams down. Yeah, but if if the ball slows down and then a team is is too ambitious and they say no no we're going to keep playing, then it's the it's the wrong decision because you can't you can't keep playing you can't keep getting gain lines off slow ball. Yeah, but so then I think it's how it's, you kick then right? Yeah, well, um, Saracens. There was a good example of Saracens. I thought. Um, the one that Conway plucked over his head, mm. GA style, Unbelie- unbelievable. Yeah, From a stand class. and start, it was class, yeah. yeah. But I think that was the right time to kick. Everything slowed down a little bit. I think um, Liam Williams was in a bit of space. I think that was a good example of whenever the ball slows down a little bit, you may as well take your beating and make it a 50-50. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you keep trying to play, then then you'll keep um, conceding gain lines and then whenever you do eventually kick, you'll not be kicking on your terms. Yeah. So it's a more rushed, it's less organised and you've less chance of uh, um, getting the ball back. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think I we're, saying the, we're kind of saying the same thing, but I think I, I think the difference is Leinster and Saracens keep the ball fast yeah. and they just play, play, play and they never let the defence get settled to make a big hit to change the tide. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Is that what I said? <laughs> I'm agreeing with you anyway. Uh, Sean Troy asked us actually on Twitter, where do they go from here, Monster? Do, do they double down on imports, retreat back to the academy, let Gran- Van Gran uh, clear the coaching ticket? Well, I definitely don't think that. I think with uh, with Felix and Fla, they've got two of the most dedicated players uh, or, that I've ever played with uh, and coaches that I think they'll have. Um, they, they potentially could, you know, I'm not sure what Van Gran's actual game plan is um, you know it's clear to see what Leinster's is Saracen's and uh, and Connacht and Ulster so he's not, he's only been here a short period of time I'd like to see hopefully next year that he maybe brings in another uh, coach that looks after the, the attacking tactics or something like that that will that will bring another yeah but uh, it does take time ball. as well Mark McCall yeah. didn't turn Saracen's into this this team overnight exactly. And they had to learn a few lessons along the way as well. Yeah, you could beat by uh, by Toulon at least a couple of times, mm. two or three times along the way. Yeah, learn a few hard lessons, and then eventually through those lessons, then is mm. Van Graan's only been here a year, hasn't he? Mm. Yeah, year? Year just over a year, year and, and a half. half. Yeah. So and look, the other side of it is you're missing Carberry and Keith Earls, and I think that is a huge. Like when you're talking about um, attacking prowess and tactics, then you're missing your two. Uh, best attacking players. Yeah. then obviously that's going to be a, a huge. Oh yeah, we 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 thing. talked about the 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 impact of a James Lowe. Mm. So that's this, probably similar to the impact of a Keith Earls for Monster, mm. or you know, similar enough anyway. Yeah. Uh, or Joey Carberry at ten, the guy who's going to get the ball in his hands more often. Yeah. Than anybody else on the pitch. There's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, absolutely. There's there, there's very very. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> Fine, <laughs> Fine margins. margins. 
Uh, we do have to talk about the monster fan that came onto the pitch wearing a lovely pair of loafers, I must say. Um, and Vinipolo said that he was scared for his life uh, that this monster fan was, <laughs> was this 10 stone monster fan was going to do to him, which I thought was uh, quite ridiculous. But it was, look, I. It was such a circus uh, the weekend, I thought. BT Sport uh, kind of soft-shoeing around the whole thing and uh, I was a little bit irked by the whole thing. I'd prefer if it would just all fuck off so we can move on and start talking about rugby again. So we can talk about Game of Thrones. Game <laughs> of <Yeah>, Thrones, exactly, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think if that was RT or TV3 that you managed that, they would have done it completely in a more classier style. I think Don Lennon, if he was commentating on that game, would never have given Von Apollo a man of the match because he knows that that was not the right thing to do. Um, I think we've all moved on as f a species in the last few years and we know that that is a, a very small-minded way of thinking and look to just bury it and put it away. It's like, yeah, um, it was. A, it's a shame that it has to to go down those those routes and that we have to, to talk about things like that in this day and age. But um, yeah, I'd happily get back to talking about positive rugby and Game of Thrones. And this brings us to the most positive of all rugby people, and that is Mr. John Hayes, who <laughs> Pat sat down with last week for a chat about all the great things that he achieved in his career. And Game of Thrones. <laughs> he has no idea what Game of Thrones <laughs> is. <laughs> Ulster A, you were saying you had a famous spectator in the crowd. Oh yeah, that was um, 2011, was, was out injured during the Six Nations, so I didn't get to play in it. Probably wouldn't have been picked in it anyway, so it's all I want. But I uh, had to get a bit of game time, so up for Munster A against Ulster A up in Ulster on a club ground. And was just warming up like down behind the goals, getting ready to go on at half time or just after. And I saw a big car pull in, I don't know what it was, but um, actually fell like I was just walking past and it was Rory McIlroy, so it was... An amazing spectator to have at the game, but he wasn't there just to take in the game. He's good mates with Darren Cave, who was playing for Ulster so that's why he was at it. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, the, the other one, just to get it out of the way, is this um, that we were talking about earlier on, the, the 2009 game, uh, when you guys won the Grand Slam and headed home and stuff, and the, the, the famous story of you hitting the road back. Um, you were saying that that's not just because you didn't want to have the party now, you, you had a reason to get home. Well, yeah, we had. We, we had just had a little baby, Roshin was born just two weeks before that, so I hadn't really seen her that much because we'd been in camp for a lot of those last two weeks before that game, so um, just said it to Declan on the way home on the plane. Then when we got back to Dublin, could I slip away down home? But I think the state of some of the boys on the plane as well who hadn't had been to bed at all, I'd say, the night before, made the decision easier just to get out of there. And you tune in to the news maybe that night, or Fiona does, and you see Tommy Bow singing up on stage as well near yes I, I was literally back home by the time Tommy gave his performance uh, in front of the mansion house in Dublin and just laughing at it going just going glad not to be there there's, um, there's some brilliant pictures of uh, on sports final info of your final game you, you kind of knew it was coming I think it was the Connacht game in, in the I think the Pro 12 it probably was back then but yeah. uh, to have kind of Fiona on the pitch and the kids and stuff like that as well when you when they, you look back can the kids remember much of that game or are they they barely remember. Sally was, what age was Sally Destin? She was five, nearly six. Like, so she remembers the more Roshan was only two, like two and a half, something like So she barely remembers little bits of it and stuff like that. But uh, no, for me, it was great because I knew it was my last game. Tony McGann was the monster coach at the time. And he told me, look, he says, we'll finish up at this one. It's, it's at home. There was another game to come after that in the Christmas period that I could have been available for. But he said, we just won't bother. You can have your last one at home. And... I really appreciated that, and it was a great occasion. We won and all on the night, so it turned out to be a great night. And, and the um, to this day, you're kind of saying then that at least it, there's YouTube footage around. Is there is there good YouTube footage of you around? Is it just the, the anthem with were you crying, or is there anything <laughs> decent you can show the kids? Yeah, no, the, I think there's they're getting a bit older now. They're like for the first few years after I retired, they didn't didn't mean anything to them about having played professionally and that. But I think maybe lately now they are having a look. To, it, they are appreciating a bit more this. But Phil and I did play for Ireland. It's um, it's kind of funny to see, you know, like these days you'll have 50 minutes, Furlong might come off and, and Porter will come on or John Ryan will come on. It's, it's, it's two guys there, it's three or four lads playing one position, but you pretty much were flogged for your 11 years <laughs> of professional rugby. Yeah, it, it, was, it, it was the way it was at the time. There was only the one sub on the bench for the, for the front row, so it wasn't like it, it is now where you have the full front where everybody's getting changed. So... 
someone had to do the full 80 and it, it usually turned out to be me but when you get used to it it was just part of it you trained for it and we literally didn't know any different like but sometimes it would have been blown a bit hard like me but you just had to get on with it and your start as well you you, you said a little bit of hurling a little bit of football as well not not rugby rugby didn't feature until later on in, in maybe in your teenage years yeah no it was there was no rugby at all from from growing up just watching on television watching what would have been the five nations at that stage it was a uh, GA school, GA parish playing hurling and football, and it was just it was literally after school, even a year after I'd left school before eventually, um, just from watching it on television, wanted to have a go at it. And then was was there somebody who kind of was there a lad who kind of mentioned it to you that you might be good for it or that you can kind of credit to for dragging you into this life? Um, no, um, John O'Dee, a friend of mine from Capmore, who who actually was playing for Brough at the time, he'd be a bit older than me, like, but he was playing, so that was finally my way of getting to go to he was actually going training so I actually just went with him if he hadn't been still going I don't know how long it might have taken before I'd actually have haven't had no connections or nobody to I would have had to wander in someplace on my own so it would have been tough but that was the way into that club and delighted that I turned up in Brough that time and did you have a stint over in Invercargill was that true in New Zealand at some stage yeah two years in New Zealand um, 1995 1996 um just wanted to go, like I suppose a lot of young fellas would do at the time, want to live overseas someplace for a while, and it worked out both ways, went for one season and stayed for a second one, so loved every minute of it out there. And did you do bits and pieces of work when you were over there? That's the South Island, isn't it? Down yeah. in Vicar, at the very bottom of the South Island, yeah, so I was working as a welder over there and playing rugby as well. Cause, and and the, the kind of, I think, did, did Ireland do a tour at that time as well, around that time, and, and they were getting hammered in midweek games uh, as well? Right? That was the year after I came back. Yeah. Um, I came back at the end of 96 and then in 97 they went out there on a, it was called a development tour, a lot of young fellas. So I was on standby for that tour actually and was back playing with Shannon at that stage, didn't get on the original tour. But yeah, it turned out to be a tough tour from the results that happened at the time. And then what's it when you came in, I remember talking to David Wallace before and he was talking about the, the early days, that I think he went on that tour actually. Yeah, while he was on that, yeah. And the, the early days of being a monster and is there kind of anything that sticks out when you kind of think of those early days? I remember Wally was talking about uh, one of the lads mentioned at one stage we want to win the Heineken Cup and he was nearly laughed out of the room. Like, was, yeah. it, was it a weird kind of... Absolutely, yeah. If, if what was professional at that stage, what we trained, how we trained, where we trained, what we did, like compared to what the guys do nowadays, it's just it's not even comparable. Like, And yeah, we were there training. We didn't even have a full-time strength and conditioning coach. We didn't have a full-time coach even the first year before. Declan Kidney actually took the job full-time. And we were playing against these other teams from England and France, especially like that, were actually professional and full time and knew what they were about. And when someone did eventually suggest that we would have, like, you know, it wasn't really taken seriously. It took a year or two before we actually started beating a few teams, and then we actually believed that maybe, yeah, we could actually win this thing. And yeah, was there a game that, that yeah, for you guys, where there was a result, or you went away from home and got a result where you kind of felt that geez, maybe we can start taking this seriously? Yeah, the big one would have been. Um, John Langford had come from Australia and Keith Wood had come back from Harlequins um, in the summer of 1999 and then that year then we did go over and we beat Saracens in London and they had some big names, Francois Pienaar was playing stuff like that and we beat them over there and that was probably where to actually for any team to win away from home is the toughest thing to do in any competition and we, when we actually did that one over there we did little, believe a little bit more after that. There's a funny little thing with Munster, it seems like a real family vibe, sometimes the, the players get in there with the fans at the end of the games and go celebrating them. Was there a cohort of like maybe 100 even less than that who went to all the away games in those early days as well? Yeah, from support's point of view it would have been fairly small at that stage that they were starting to, it was just the start of European journeys and starting to travel more and more to games so there would have been, you would have recognised faces that you'd have seen at the games before that they were starting to travel to those games. And then, um, I suppose then the, the journey was probably made to sweeter because you because of some of the tough times there. But um, two thousand and six, you know, how, what was that feeling? You know, to have a whole stadium full of well, eighty percent monster fans and to, to, to finally lift that cup. Yeah, the unfortunate thing in some ways there maybe need nearly a little bit of relief in it for a finish because we've been trying for so long. Like, but no, that day was extra special because it was all in Cardiff, and um, just travelling down to the ground and uh, the bus like the the place was just red with flags and supporters like and literally to get in there the stadium was packed the monster fans owned it and just the roof was closed the noise they've created just one of the best atmospheres ever and then tough game went behind but just no panic and then just eventually won in the end up and just best feeling ever then after that 
and a special place as well, the Millennium Stadium, because then the Grand Slam of 2009 as well. It, it's, we were talking earlier again about the best memories, but like, it, 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 is that up there at the very top? Oh, it is, yeah. There's two Heineken Cups there, actually. We were back there two years later in 08 and won the second one, and then won the Grand Slam there the year after. So in those years, from 06 to 09, it was a pretty special place winning those three big trophies there. And is it, is it one thing when you kind of look back on, is it, is it the stuff you miss, the stuff that happens in the dressing room after the games and kind of being in with all the lads? Is that, is that one of the things, if you're talking about missing anything, do you kind of miss that a lot? You do, yeah. You, you miss everything with the lads because I don't think there's any other profession where you, you can carry on and get on with each other the way you do as professional sports people like that. The, the gym, the bus, the, like, it's just it's childish nearly at times. You can still carry on that childish humour the whole way on. And then, but the, the feeling after a big win, not just a, um, a trophy, but just a big win for those 20 minutes, half an hour after a game is just the best feeling in the world. Like where you've just backed up everything that you've said out you're going to do all week, like, and it's, it's just brilliant. And um, I suppose the likes of you, you would have come across then Barry, then Barry Murphy, and, and um, you know, you, you just would have crossed past for a few seasons, I'd say, there. Um, yeah. Near the end for you, but anything from him that ever stand out? Ever was he a good man for the Slaggins as well? Or? Oh, he was great, crack. Yeah, like you know, the worst thing about him always was he was too good at singing. Like you know, because it was always get somebody up to the front of the bus. You know, and the the worse they were, the longer you leave him there to just watch him suffer. But then he would just go up and take the mics. That seemed to kind of get him off. Like you know, he's too good. Like but no, he was a quality player. I remember when he came into the into the season there in 06 even. People remember him like before he got injured. He was just going to be a quality player. And, and then with someone like Tr uh, Trimby then as well. Um, did you guys ever kind of? He, for, for me, I'd say he's got a kind of a quirky sense of humour as well. Is it was he a good man for the Slaggins as well? well he was, you? but he kind of burned me a little bit. <laughs> Trimby, I was, I was obviously a lot older, but I was in the squad and I, I roomed with Tommy Ball for a first few while, for a few weeks maybe when Tommy had come in first. But then Trimby got into the squad, and suddenly didn't. I know that Trimby went to somebody and said, I want to room with Tommy, like, so he kind of got me out, like, because he thought he wanted himself and Tommy to room together, like, so I always had a kind of little bit of a feeling for him after that, then, that he didn't, he didn't like me. But he didn't like rooming with me then, then he wanted to room with Tommy, that they wanted to form their little clique, like, so they had something against me. The, because um, I remember, yeah, Craig Gilroy, we had him on the show there recently, and he was saying that, uh, yeah, he remembers at the start being almost starstruck by, by Trimby up with the Ulster squad stuff and he remembers waving to him a couple of times and getting nothing in response as well. <laughs> is, is that the thing as well where you kind of, and you're talking about the lads having to sing up the top of the bus that like it's that thing as well where you're tough on the new guys as well and you have to be tough on the new guys it, 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 you haven't had it easy so you dish it out as well well yeah there's definitely a bit of that there because it's gone on it's a tradition so you got it when you were young so it's kind of passed on to the next one the old song at the front of the bus is, is part of it and it's tough going if you're not able to, unlike Bez, who would just just give me the mic, like so it was easy for him. <laughs> and the, in your in your time, you, do you ever have to sing as well? Did you did you ever crack out a song? I had to sing at the start, like the usual, like yeah, like any it would have been no like, Christy Moore number or something like that, just nice and handy and get it over with. Wouldn't be good at it, so just get it done. And, and then th there is again the legend of you just kind of walking away from rugby and washing your hands of it completely, but you still kind of keep your your hand in a little bit watching games and doing a bit of coaching as well don't you? yeah i do a small bit of coaching with brough like which is my club where i started out but um i watch all the monster games still like i don't you don't go to them they're not your, your life doesn't revolve around them anymore so you're not going to all the games all the time but i always know whenever they're on whatever day of the week it's on whether it's friday or saturday and just usually unless it's at a very awkward time that doesn't suit i'll get to take them all in and there, there is that thing when you're, you're getting, maybe you're, you're sitting here watching the game with the, the family, you skip the, the analysis maybe before, but when the anthems are kicking off, do you still kind of get that, the old stirrings of kind of, jeez, I wouldn't mind being out there? I do actually, yeah, there's, there's, um, there's no point saying otherwise, like that you do miss them. Every time I hear or on the Veen or the start of the Six Nations, I do actually remember that it was a great, I used to love the Six Nations and I love that, I just love being part of it and you, you Every so often you would miss it some bit, like, yeah. Perfect. All right. Cheers, Fat John. Okay, welcome back to the House of Rugby Rugby Roundup. Uh, that was John Hayes. What a lovely fella. <laughs> oh, brilliant. What a lovely old firm yours, John Hayes. Brilliant be here, isn't he? Yeah, I love, what I loved Hayes about him most in, a, in Monster's setup was that he, all he wanted was the crack and he wanted to have most crack with the young lads that came through so you just had to be sound and good laugh and that's all he cared about so in the gym or a training he would 
he didn't care how many caps you had or anything like that. Like himself and Keith Earls were best friends when Keith yeah. was about really? 19 and Hayes was about 43, I'd say, at the time. <laughs> and the two of them were just thick as thieves. He loved yeah. them. Is that right, really? Yeah, he used to call him Scobie or something like that and they'd just hang around together. Brilliant. Um, and like Hayes, he just, he would always, I remember he came, a, came across me one time when I'd, I was playing the gauntlet of not putting diesel in my car for a while. I was seeing how, you know, I'd, get that last 70 kilometers out of it yeah. when the light came on makes you feel alive yeah. <laughs> I, I still play it to this day like it's such, but I, i'd get caught occasionally and uh one time i got caught and i ran into diesel on the main road and of course the first person that came across me was john hayes like, just like <laughs> appalled yeah. that someone would do that yeah he would never let his tank go below no halfway like country fellows have no time for that sort no. of behavior and he'd have a full tank of diesel in the back of the car as well Probably not the sort of diesel you can put in yours, though. <laughs> Dodgy John Hayes. <laughs> You're a rascal. Him. Uh, he had a bit of a pop-off you there for... He did, yeah. Didn't he? Yeah. Jeez. Unprovoked. Yeah. Was that um, true? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, the farts. The farts and the snoring, I think, upset Tommy. Yeah. I think Tommy was texting me, giving off. And then I maybe told Hayes that Tommy was slagging him. <laughs> 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 and then... <laughs> things kind of went from bad to worse. Their relationship went a bit sour. And then I was like, well, listen, you, you could always move back in with me, Tommy. Yeah. And that was that. Oh, yeah, Hayes should have been left in his own most of the time, I think. Yeah. Um, but thank you very much, John Hayes. Uh, he's a huge fan of Hermitage Green, actually. Is he? Yeah. His I think I've said this before, his daughter names uh, all his cattle oh, yes. after our songs. Yeah, that's right. Which is fantastic because yeah. he would obviously deny the fact that he's ever listened to our music, but I know his daughter, Sally has named one of his cows Gibson, one of them Renegade, one of them Shine. Brilliant. We have a brand new single out this week, actually, I must give it a plug, it's called Heaven. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope to God Sally names one of her cows Heaven. Heaven? Yeah. It Good certainly gosh. won't be Bull naming the, yeah. naming the cow Heaven. Or Kevin, maybe. Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, the rest of the rugby roundup. Uh, Guinness Pro 14 games back on this weekend. Uh, Ulster versus Leinster. Do you reckon Stockdale start at 15 again? It's the biggest one for me. Uh, uh, maybe, but Mike Laurie might be fit. Mm. If he's fit, then it'll go back to Balakoon and Stockdale on the wings, Yeah, I think. Oh, I'd love Little as well. Yeah, oh, yeah of course. Yeah. power there. Sorry, yeah, it could be Bal Well, it'll definitely be Jacob. Mm. It'll be one of the two of them. Mm. No, you're right, sorry, it could be either. Yeah, I loved Stockdale at 15, I must say. He was, I mean, you can play him anywhere, obviously, he's going to be he's going to be lethal, but um, you did create a lot of space yeah. as well as Although, actually, the finisher. Th this week they might make a few changes. They might um, rest yeah. a few guys. Do you think they'll start? I think, yeah. They, they don't like they don't have to win. They're, no. This, it's a nothing game, really. So It's a nothing game, but it is Leinster at home. So even so selection-wise, it could be you know a few guys who wouldn't usually get a nod. But intensity-wise, I think it'll be a proper inter-pro. Mm. Leinster probably... The tough one for Leinster is then if they don't... You know, they play this weekend, then they don't play the following weekend because that's the quarterfinals of the Pro 14. Then they have the final of the European Cup the following week. So if, if they rest all their top players this weekend, then they won't have played for three weeks. Yeah. Um, which I suppose stood to them well yesterday against Toulouse, but yeah. still a risky one. Yeah, I think Leinster, <coughs> up until this weekend, their form had been a little bit iffy. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought it might have been because they qualified... Uh, for a home uh, semi-final so long ago mm. that th they weren't as competitive week in, week out. Uh, and that'll be solved this weekend by the fact that it makes no difference who wins this game, but it's an Interpro, so they'll mm. have that intensity back. But you're right, they'll probably... I'd say they'll probably make a few changes. They'll pr probably meet halfway. Anyone that's probably a bit risky, like yeah. Sean O'Brien, they'll rest him. He got yeah. through a ton of work yesterday. Henshaw, probably because he hasn't played a lot of rugby. Sexton... Um, They'll rest him. Even Luke McGrath, who like is such an integral part of that side, um, and Gibson Park potentially being injured, um, they might rest him. Uh, but other than that, yeah, they've such a strong squad. It doesn't even make that much of a difference, does it? Yeah, no, they'll be Leinster. They could send yeah. a, a second string up, and that be, be nice be for Ulster to get a win, though. Yeah, uh, Munster versus Connacht. Munster can get, get top spot in the in the pool if they beat Connacht in Thoma Park. Connacht whereas and have have nothing to play for really they they will uh, automatically go to a quarter final anyway so 
Monster probably will put on a put out a stronger team, um, because if Glasgow are beaten by Edinburgh on Saturday night, then Monster could go top. Yeah, they'll end up level on points, but then Munster will have won one more game than them, so they'll they'll qualify. Right. I think it's it's the incentive is not necessarily to get a home semi final, but the incentive is to to have a week off maybe. Mm. Kind of the break going into it. Yeah. Maybe. Don't know. Yeah, yeah, it would be nice. I think they've obviously got through a lot of work those players last weekend, so he they probably will rest quite a few of them. Um, but it's going to be a great game. I can't wait to to see it. It should be a dry day and seen the Connacht come down and obviously they're going to try and beat Munster on that patch anyway they'll always want to and they've had a rest uh, of a week as well uh, battle for third spot in conference B Treviso are playing Zebra at home so probably favourites to get it I'd imagine I'd say so yeah I was a massive fan of Treviso until Munster went over and taught them a lesson yeah uh, they've been Treviso have been going unbelievably well that, mm. that Munster game is probably just a bit of a blip for them I'd imagine they'll get back very exciting, isn't it, for those yeah. quarterfinals? As you were saying, you made this point earlier on that European Cup's brilliant, but the gap between kind of how excited you get about European Cup and yeah. certainly at this stage when it gets to knockout stages. Yeah, I think like a lot of people are complaining about the, the amount of people that went to the games of the weekend. There was half stadium full in the, the Rico and then the Aviva wasn't full yesterday. But when you think about the games that are to come in the in the Pro 14, you can completely understand why yeah. there's not that gap that there once was between the European Cup and this I, yeah. I've i been enjoying the Pro 14 even more because it's weekly and it's uh, the standard has been so high and some brilliant games so yeah it's going to be a great running um, also just a quick one as we mentioned the stop Warren, or the start of the show uh, Warren Gatland has been uh, highly tipped to be the, the next Lions coach again yeah by the Telegraph mm-hmm wasn't he highly tipped to take over as the England coach after the World Cup he as well? Was, yeah, I, did, I couldn't have seen that happen. I'm delighted. I don't think that should happen. Not that the, I mean, the, they can both happen though. I suppose. Yeah, but yeah, Eddie Jones is supposed yeah. to be going until I think maybe it is 2021. He's supposed to oversee some predecessor. So it it, leave, it would leave the door open for Gatlin's to take over, but mm. and maybe give it a bit of time. Oh, for the I Welsh wouldn't. Fans, yeah, but be, I'd hate to see that happen. Yeah. Would you? Yeah. I, I would imagine Gatlin would be, be the number one Lions. I, 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 would like, I would like to see it happen. Would you? It's it would just all push. kick off. And <laughs> it's none of our business, but it would just be fun to watch them all hate <laughs> each other and fall yeah. out. Imagine him having to go into that dressing room. Do you ever like, have a player who, who came from a rival team who yeah. came in and was like, I'm all about E now. Yeah. And as much as you're like, great, you're like, oh, I don't know if I, I trust don't know. you. Yeah. I was just getting well paid. It's yeah, yeah. a great career move. Yeah, this is such a proud club. This is such a pro team. Yeah, that I'm yeah. Imagine yeah. going into the English dress room saying that. Where are we again? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whereas you know that for him, for the last 10 years for Wales, he's been like, fucking hate the English. Yeah, yeah go after them. So mightn't happen but look we, as you said we will watch as spectators and happily see that happen uh, we also asked you to vote on your Guinness Made and More Irish Player of the Weekend and here were your nominees three Leinster lads Johnny Sexton Jack Conan and James Lowe Chris Farrell of Munster uh, but thank you for all your votes and comments the winner is Johnny Sexton another set of teeth another trophy is, has he received any teeth? Sure he has. I think this is his first set of teeth. Is it? Yeah, I don't think mm. we've mentioned Johnny much. Because we were too like, oh, he gets everything. Is that the yeah. way we were before? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm. No teeth for you, Johnny. Well, you're getting a set now. <laughs> POC's teeth are on the way for you. Um, congratulations, Johnny. He'll be delighted with that now. Yeah. Um, we also asked you uh, for some of your Twitter questions with hashtag AskHOR. And as we mentioned at the top, we were flooded with responses. Here are some of your best uh, who is the Swiss role, J Swiss role, uh, who is the natural successor to best as Ireland, uh, considering, or best, the natural successor to best as captain, um, or Ireland considering John, Johnny Sexton is getting on in years, it is a time to invest in youth and give James Ryan the early nod, let him, or let him go on with smashing lads, don't burden him with the title of captain, but. Oh, what's Jim, is he 22? James Ryan. Younger, 22, 23. So, I think um, he could easily step up and be captain. He seems like that sort of a fella. 22. But, 
I don't know, just it, it would be such a risk for him to take on a little bit more responsibility. You just never know what that what impact that could have on him, on the pitch and he's performing so well. I would probably avoid giving him that. Yeah, I think when a young player takes takes on captaincy, they really have to stand out like as someone who like when Draco got it, it made sense. I think Michael Hooper was 22 when he got it frustrated. What's Michael Hooper's only like 27 now? He's been yeah. captain for four or five years. Yeah. It still made sense because he had that air about him for some reason. Whereas James Ryan, I think I'd leave him do what he's doing. Let him. Yeah, he's flying. Keep smashing. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Omani? Yeah, absolutely. Pizza. Or Johnny? Yeah. I think I'd say Johnny for the. I mean, Johnny will want to captain Ireland, you know, so yeah. um, I think he, he's earned it. So. I certainly wouldn't have any problem giving it to him for next year, next Six Nations, but Pete would be the natural uh, one, maybe even Earlsey at some point. And, yeah, Tardo is um, a wing, I think. I do think, yeah, yeah. I think it's tricky, yeah. Hmm. Just having experienced that firsthand, yeah. it's tricky to, to come from the wing. Okay. Yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Plenty more to put their hands up. Uh, Anthony English uh, had an... An epic Game of Thrones uh, theory, kind of challenging ours, but um, yeah, I'm happy to be challenged. Yeah, yeah, I love it. What he made more of an effort than we've made in the whole series, uh, putting this stuff together. So will you give us a readout? Okay. And then we've got to surprise you then on the phone afterwards. Right? Yeah. <coughs> so four provinces, um, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones houses. Many contains, may contain spoilers if not completely up to date. I disagree that Monster of the Starks, good mm -hmm. man, good yeah, start, I'm yeah, on board. Yeah. They're, not, they're not noble enough, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think they are similar to the uh, Baratheons, considering they had three kings at once in Joffrey, Stannis and Renly. Joey Carby might be Joffrey. He claims to be Baratheon, even though everyone knows he's really a Lannister. Although he is Baratheon now. Mm. But that's anyway, a good point. Yeah. Uh, Leinster definitely are the Lannisters, never in doubt. Um, all powerful and the true rulers of the realm. Johnny Sexton is Cersei, all the power at the top. Falls from grace a while uh, while injured, but comes back stronger than before. Um, and she's prone to a few scalps when she's I pissed do, off. I do like, like, I did like Joffrey as jo Johnny Sexton and Joffrey because he was just killing lads left, right, and centre. And, yeah. Um, and I did prefer the two Kearneys as the Jamie yeah. and Cersei. <laughs> Because they were having an affair, uh, <laughs> but I'll give it to him. That that just kind of makes it works. More sense, it does work. It? Yeah, yeah. Connaught are the Starks, noble. Everyone respects them, but they don't really. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, great. But outside the province, nobody really worries about them uh, until they do something. Carty is Sansa. Um, just seems to be getting better and better. Great. I think this guy's an Ulster supporter. No, oh, totally. Yeah. Oh, that's the one thing I've... The, the last with. Ulster paragraph is like <laughs> yeah. way longer than the rest. Ulster are definitely the... Are, sorry, definitely aren't the wildlings. They're the Targaryens. Similar to the Targaryens, Ulster have almost been forgotten about in the past few years with a proud history of conquering Europe many years ago. Now with a strong leader, they look like they have the potential to become a force again. Similar to Daenerys, they just... Uh, have to bide their time and wait for the right moment to strike. McFarland is Daenerys. Um, it's not sexy enough to be Daenerys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sexiness aside. Yeah, okay. Um, he didn't say that. Um, <laughs> uh, first time being head coach and doing well. Rory Best is Sir Barristan Selmy. I had to Google this on the way back down. Who is I, he? He's, he's the guy. He was initially um, with the Baratheons and then he got um, sent, sent away by Joffrey. Oh, and yeah, then he joined yeah. the Targaryens and then he swore allegiance to Daenerys. Yeah, I remember. Um, but then died. I can't remember how he died. Anyway. He was he old. Dairy Girls. <laughs> <laughs> He's a granddad in Dairy he, Girls. He was, well. old. he was old. Can we yeah. fit a Dairy Girls? Um, <laughs> dairy Girls here. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so Rory Bess is Sir, um, Sir, Sir Rory Bess. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not a million miles away. Uh, he's Sir uh, Barristan Selmy. Loyal to the Targaryens through thick and thin. He's dead. Rory's retiring. It fits. Yep. <laughs> uh, they have three flyers. Um, Stockdale, Balakoon and Ara Sexton, a.k.a. the Dragons. Jack McGrath is Jimmy Lannister. Always uh, loyal to the Lannisters up until recently. 
Peely is Tyrion simply because he's small and advises Dan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, JP, Jared Payne is Varys. Ooh, he could be bad. That's good. He could be that's bad. Great, yeah. um, always uh, whispering in Dan's ear. John Cooney is Jon Snow. <laughs> uh, never really accepted by the Starks. Recently found out he's really a Targaryen. And then the, the last fee note is perfect. Geographically, Dragonstone is north as well. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way you finish. <laughs> Uh, look, I'll give it to you, man. That just for your effort alone, it's brilliant. It's brilliant, and we'll throw Murray Kinsella in there as Bran as well. <laughs> yeah, just giving us all the shit for going on the piss. Um, thank you so much for that. And just to to top that off, we've got some bonus content here where we had Greg Jones uh, from Ulster join us on the phone. He's a Game of Thrones fanatic, and he is going to be our Game of Thrones. Co- Correspondent. Connoisseur. Connoisseur. <laughs> uh, over the next few weeks. So uh, let's cut quickly to a quick chat we have with him. Hey, Greg, how you getting on? Trimby here. Very well, yeah. How are you, lads? Yeah, and we got Baz here as well. Hi, Greg. Hi, hey, Baz. How are you getting on? I'm good, man. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well. Greg's a big fan of the show, Baz. Is he? Yeah. This one. Jesus. Stop, stop me if I'm fan. wrong, Greg, but you're, you're a big fan of the show, yeah? This show, like. Massive fan, massive fan. Yeah, yeah it's, it's Baz and Andrew's house at Rugby. Just <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, Sub- not Game of Thrones. Subscribe. Yeah. Subscribe. Um, listen, we, uh, we've introduced a new feature, and you're right at the middle of it. Actually, um, it's uh, success very much depends on how well you perform. <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, we wanted to have, uh, we're big Game of Thrones fans, and there's obviously massive parallels with uh, Game of Thrones and Irish Rugby. So we wanted to have a, a Game of Thrones briefing with a weekly... Um, consultant? Correspondent. Correspondent. That's yeah. it, yeah. You're our yeah, Game so of Thrones correspondent, live from the field. <laughs> live from the wall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's going on in the wall, man? I've Tell us. I've reference down anyway. Yeah, um, so, so this is... Have you, this is, seen, have you, seen, we, yeah. have you watched the new one now, or are we talking first episode only, sort of? I have only seen the first episode. I didn't get the briefing from Trimmy okay. that we were going to have seen the second one, so please be sensitive. <laughs> Most people listening to this yeah, probably no, will we'll, have seen we'll, it, though. We'll, yeah, but yeah, we later on the week. Sort of in. I, yeah. Yeah, I think we need to kind of cater for people who have and keep people who haven't, yeah. because a lot of listeners are going to yeah. listen to this from Tuesday on, and they'll have watched it Monday night. But I wasn't sure. That's why I didn't tell Barry I, if I was going to watch it or not, because I didn't know if the Wi-Fi would be good enough on the train the way down, but... Uh, yeah, we're all sorted. It's a decent enough episode, um, Jonesy. Which one, two now? Don't know. Nah. We're already being careful here. <laughs> <laughs> second, it's second it's episode, yeah. Episode. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it was decent. Um, like, I thought it was a good setter up for the whole season, really. Um, like, I don't know, there was lots of sort of, there was basically just one big massive kind of nostalgia sort of thing. Yeah. Um, all the old characters meeting up again. Lots of dramatic sort of meetups. A lot of similarities with the very first ever episode, like the Baratheons and the Lannisters riding into Winterfell, similar to sort of Daenerys. Yeah, I, um, I, I thought it was a little bit... Met by a lot of weird looks. Yeah, I thought it was a little bit like um, like Christmas Eve, you know, the night before the battle. Or, <laughs> or yeah. like the night before Brexit or something. Yeah, everybody's kind of looking back nostalgia. Oh, do you remember we used to be in Europe? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, Greg, yeah, no, uh, it was good. Um, I have. Uh, we talked about this last week, and we we're saying about how this season, we just don't know what to expect. And I'm so suspicious of every character now because. Yeah, I'm definitely the same. Like, I think yeah. there's got to be a big betrayal coming. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if there's like there has to be an like, equivalent to the red wedding or the the skull crushing scene, or there's a couple yeah, other ones. There's got to be. There's got to be some. Yeah. I think like. I don't know. Virus, virus has still been floating around a lot with a lot of questions not asked about him. Like he's a he's a shady enough character by trade. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um. So I'd wonder does he have another one up the sleeve? Also thought it was kind of weird with Tyrion the way he like sort of seemed to not think that Cersei was gonna. Or sorry, seemed to be sort of fooled by Cersei. I wonder. I don't think he could con them. Like, but I don't know. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I've compiled a list of um, potential. <laughs> um, uh, people who could turn bad I suppose um, so yeah well, do you want me yeah, to run this not... list by you and then you can give us a, like a thumbs up or thumbs down or still the jury <laughs> yeah, the jury's out on them uh, for me Sir Jamie mm, I don't think so you think he's okay well, I think 
I think his sort of power for us like has gone the complete opposite way the whole so like he's obviously was pretty nasty at the start and has then kinda of proven himself to be half decent. I don't think he has another betrayal in him. I think he's all right. Yeah, okay. Um Terrian? I don't know, maybe. Uh, I'd be very surprised, but I guess that's sort of the nature of the game, right? And something that's going to surprise them, but... I don't no know, like he's be the main he's too good, isn't he? Out. Tyrion's too good. He's There's too, too much good. goodness yeah, I in him. Is. I think he is. He's been, he's been good since... Well, he was kind of dodgy at the start, but then he's been... The last while, he's been pretty good, so it'd be a, it'd be a massive shock if he did sort of go should, against him. He would kill Cersei, like. I think that would be pretty yeah. apt if he did something to yeah. her. Yeah, yeah. But he said himself, though, in the last episode, it's about survival at this stage. Uh, anyway, moving on. Number three, the big ginger wildling. <laughs> <laughs> Excitement in his voice oh, just so he got to say that. <laughs> I, I don't know his name. I don't want to know his name, Greg. <laughs> yeah, big ginger scraggy wildling. Uh, nah, he's a good bloke. He's definitely he's a good, good bloke. bloke. And, and, Tyrion will be going I for points at him at the end. He's, yeah. he's just there. He he just wants to find an unhappy enough to die, I'd say. And uh, if he can maybe get a bit of a relationship going with Brienne at some stage, he'll he'll die a happy man. Yeah, I don't think in this again a little bit of a spoiler, but he's massively keen on Brienne yeah. of of Treaders, <laughs> of Kieran Treadwell of Tar. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's a little bit like Hendy, isn't he? So the big ginger is a little bit like <laughs> Hendy. You can imagine him just choking just, fellas. Yeah, just like yeah, knees down, <laughs> <laughs> and he's mad into Treadwell. Yeah, 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 perfect. Um, okay, this is a high profile one, Daenerys. Yeah, I don't know. I think she she's she's gonna have to throw a bit of a stop whenever John sort of tells her um that he's also a Targaryen and like probably the rightful heir to the throne, but like I don't know how far she'll go with it. More importantly that he that he wrote a bit of a strop. That he wrote his end, more yeah. importantly. Yeah, that's Look, that's sort of the main one I guess. Remember I wrote you when you're gonna hurt her. Uh, <laughs> so she could just hop on the dragon and just start lighting people up really, but I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah, no, she's got a, all, I don't know. She's got a tantrum up her sleeve, I think. Well, put put yourself yeah, in, in his shoes or or your auntie's shoes. <laughs> <to the woman. laughs> yeah. What would you do? Yeah, there was, there was a, What um, would your auntie do? <laughs> this is a bit of a spoiler actually. But yeah, so um <laughs> yeah. Jon Snow confronted her and said not confronted her but told her the truth and she was only concerned about the Iron Throne, not the incest. Oh, yeah. okay. That, that, that's sort of more what I was got. Like, I think that sort of spelled out the whole thing, that she just wants to be queen, and the fact that she's his aunt doesn't seem to bother her, which is very bizarre. Um, <laughs> She's pretty hot. Like, I really there. thought that might be a bigger deal. Like, it's not a very common thing to happen. Like, so, um, yeah. 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 <coughs> I was surprised, slightly surprised by that. But maybe, maybe next episode, Trimby, you never know. She could... Yeah, she could actually take him aside and say, "Wait, I actually didn't really listen to what you said there, but the ant thing is a bit weird." So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's also um, strange timing from um, uh, from John because the the battle is just about to start. Why don't you just like don't be telling her now? Leave it yeah. till tomorrow because something might happen, and then obviously something's going to happen yeah. in the battle. One, there's a moment, and she'll have a decision to make. That's the way I see that panel out. Yeah, that was strange. I really thought he'd kind of make it an awful nice and because, like, surely that'll be playing on her head um, at some stage. But yeah. I guess he probably didn't really think it through all that. I know, I know. It's like um, your missus tells you she's expecting like the, the on game day or something. <laughs> You're like, oh, for, leave it to tonight. <laughs> it's, it's just that in a way more messed up realm, I guess. Yeah, yeah. What about yeah. the hound? He's signed, isn't he? He's actually, your nephew. Yeah, the hound's a good lad. Good lad. He's a good lad to be fair. Um, uh, Very Pod- good lad. Podrick's dead on, isn't he? He's grand. He's deaf. Well, I don't know. I would tell him too harmless to have anything up his sleeve, but maybe the hound. Like he's nasty, but he is. He seems like a good bloke. Like I don't think he'd, he'd maybe mess anyone over anymore, but he could do. Yeah, he could. He's yeah. one of, another one of the characters who, at the end of the day, seems like he probably only really cares about himself, which is yeah. probably fair enough. Offer him an old bit of cash, and he'll. Yeah. He'll take someone out yeah, happily. Yeah. yeah. Sir, uh, yeah. Sir, Sir George. I'm a bit Braun. like Braun, actually. That's not... Braun. Um, yeah. I'm coming to Braun. He's getting offered. Oh, he's on the list. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We're no, ahead he's on the list uh, and he's, I'm building he just, up to Braun. He just yeah. wants to get the ride, though, surely. He's not, Braun? Yeah. He's not too bothered about anything else, is he? <laughs> he doesn't look concerned nah, about riding. No, but he cashes. The only other thing that bothers him cash oh, and riding. So, 
he's been offered cash to kill Terry and Jamie and like yeah I tell you, uh, yeah you never know so uh, Varys yeah, is the other one I know you mentioned him I know you mentioned Varys yeah I'd say uh, I'd say Varys or Jor Jor Mormont's kind of already messed Daenerys over a bit and probably learned his lesson getting locked away and his skin going grey and um, that was probably pretty grim for him so I'd say he'll be alright but Varys maybe yeah he's he's one of those lads who's probably been playing the long game yeah yeah no Varys I think he's probably he could, could he be chief suspect he could be in the mix there anyway. Yeah, I would say I would say potentially chief suspect. If the chief suspect, but the White Walkers lads are like the elephant in the room here. Like, do you know what I mean? They're all yeah. fucked if they don't get the White Walkers sorted. <laughs> it's like who who cares who fucks uh, yeah. what over if these lads just come in I and find, blast us it, all. Yeah, it's very strange how like Bran is just sort of floating around the stoner people and. They don't seem, I don't know if it hasn't actually dawned on them, but like they literally have a person who can see anywhere at any time and they don't seem to be asking them any questions. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's whether they already know the full extent of it or what, but it's like surely they just ask, is, where's the Night King? Or they don't get wrong. Simple, like just, yeah. he's, he's sort of just chilling, staring at people out of it the whole time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's sitting, uh, I guess, in the last episode there. Um, there, Jimmy Lannister arrives and he's given his um, uh, he's given his kind of he's saying you know why he's here or he's presenting himself to um, Daenerys and then again everyone's just chatting amongst themselves and Bran's always just sitting creepily in the background <laughs> <laughs> like Montgomery Burns yeah. <laughs> and he just goes um, the things we do for love and everybody's like what, what? Oh, yeah. Bran shut up mate <laughs> <laughs> give him a break yeah. would you that was a good little nod. I actually thought he might say that when Jamie first met him, but uh, yeah, he's dropping lines like that. But he's not really, he's, I don't know why people aren't asking questions. Like, Surely he could be a suspect maybe for someone who's, I don't know, is he doing something sneaky on the side? Yeah, that's the beauty of it though. You, just know, you, never know, you never know who to trust. Yeah. And as a squad up there, uh, Greg, do you, watch all, do you watch these shows together? Do you have little, little get-togethers <laughs> no, no, no. and... Or will you will you will you just come no, together this morning and talk about it? Yeah, there's been no get-togethers for the last two episodes, as far as I know. But yeah, there's been a good, good bit of chat, at, like breakfast and stuff, uh, about the episodes. But uh, maybe for the final one, it could be one. I don't know. Yeah, hasn't been talked about. It's bringing everyone closer together. To be fair. Yeah, we're gonna get Shanahan on next week um, as our um, as our yeah. Game of Thrones consultant, correspondent, correspondent. <laughs> And and then what happens for the last three? Is it just a, you know, basically between me and Tanners? Yeah, this is a, pretty much a head to head. We'll get you on for debate <laughs> and debate in a few weeks, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice one. Listen, Greg. Um, uh, you're injured at the minute, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I am. Yeah. Yeah. But I thought this was Game of Thrones only. <laughs> Ah, go on. Give us an idea of what's the story. <coughs> we have to talk about uh, some sort uh, of rugby. <laughs> Uh, just injured ligaments in my ankle, um, like ATFL immediate ligaments. So it's like six weeks, but hopefully not too bad. Season right. sort of over, but just yeah, not, I don't have to get surgery yet. And so yeah, get yourself ready for holidays, and then start it all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, listen, right, that's yeah. great. Um, I think um, the the excitement's building nicely. Um, towards the end of the season and towards the season finale that was nice <laughs> <laughs> uh, but listen thanks so much and we'll, uh, we'll we'll catch you soon then good luck with the injury cheers lad right we made it thank you everybody for your comments questions for listening on all your favourite apps and for watching us on YouTube and actually someone left us a lovely rating on iTunes and a comment that said something like slice pan is good and all but Baz and Andrew's house of rugby is pure fab something well better lines. than better than sliced bread yeah what else what else would be better than um electricity <laughs> <laughs> definitely the, the internet the internet yeah. the wheel the wheel yeah the all blacks yeah keep going i might that's great good <laughs> power rangers <laughs> <laughs> um nice die hard die harder Her. die hardest <laughs> For the vengeance. Die hard eating. A big, big thank you, everyone, that has been involved in making the show this week. Paul, Fiona, Anthony, and Pat. 
Uh, thanks for our guest. Thank you to John Hayes. Thank you to Greg for coming on and doing the Game of Thrones thing. We'll be back next week to talk all about the Pro 14. Look what's coming up with the quarterfinals and semifinals and to bring you more on our Game of Thrones. Thank you very much. This has been Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby here on Joe together with Guinness Party On. Party On. 